Hi, I'm Christine Pere, and welcome to this IEEE hosted Google Hangout. Today's session is the January 29th edition of the AR in Your Future series of webinars and hangouts. On January 22nd, I presented as part of this series uh, the findings of a study I performed about augmented reality in medicine, healthcare, and wellness, and I introduced a few conceptual frameworks. I described some use cases and some barriers and some of the relevant standards for medical data. Today I'll be discussing the topics of using augmented reality to visualize contextually relevant human data with three worldwide experts. Augmented reality in medical and healthcare scenarios is already a vast topic and it'll continue to grow I'm sure in the years ahead and as we uh, get further and further into testing and more new investments are made to take advantage of the benefits of augmented reality assistance systems. The expect experts I've enjoyed <laughs> the experts I've invited to join us today will share their experiences uh, in these domains. They'll tell us the success stories that they've had and uh, some of the trials and test beds that they're working on. In addition to the technical issues, we'll also be talking about cultural and business issues that are uh, part, of the, part of the landscape and frequently encountered. These experts have agreed to spend this hour with us to help all of us learn more about augmented reality assisted procedures and better understand our roles and where we can focus our efforts uh, in the future. Near the end of the hour, we'll take questions from the audience. If you have a question or comments, just tweet that to IEEEAR, the hashtag I-E-E-E-A-R. Now let's begin with some introductions. Nasir Nawab, Dr. Nasir Nawab is a full professor at both the Technical University of Munich and the Johns Hopkins University. And he's the chair of the Computer Aided Medical Procedures and Augmented Reality Group. His work combines medicine and computer science and focuses on computer-aided medical procedures. He's a member of the technical staff of Siemens Corporate Research and a member of the board of MICCAI, the organization that uh, runs leading conferences on medical image computing. He's on the editorial board of numerous journals in the field and has authored hundreds of scientific publications. And uh, he earned his PhD at INRIA and a postdoc at MIT Media Lab. Welcome, Nasir. Dr. Terry Roberts is a scientist at the Imaging Research Laboratories at Robots Research, Robarts Research Institute and the professor in the departments of medical imaging and medical biophysics at the Western University, London, Canada. In the past 30 years, his research has focused on the application of computational hardware and software advances to medical imaging. Uh, he's a pioneer in many of the image guidance techniques and applications in neurosurgery. Dr. Peters has authored over 250 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters, and he speaks about his work to audiences worldwide. And I've heard in his keynote last year at ISMAR. Uh, Sleiman Itani is founder and chief scientist of Athir Labs, a Silicon Valley company developing a new hardware and software platform to advance human-centric computing technologies and empower users to have technology working with them in unprecedented ways. Sleiman's history included uh, developing cancer tests and treatments, and he's also worked in the domains of ro robotics and drones, unmanned aerial vehicles. He received his Master of Science and PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. I'd like to uh, get us started a little bit by talking about use cases. You know, we, there's so many of them. It's kind of embarrassing. It's an embarrassment of riches. But I'd like you to describe to us what you think are the best use cases, which are most likely to be mm, coming forward sooner, um, and uh, just generally discuss perhaps the use case categories that, that you think are most important. Uh, let's see. Terry, would you like to, uh, to begin? Sure. Um... I've been involved in medical imaging for a, a very long time and in image-guided interventions from 
very very early stages of when uh, CT scans and MR scans were used by neurosurgeons. So it always seemed like um, a good idea to be able to take a three-dimensional image volume and somehow register that to the patient so that the surgeon would have an immediate uh, three-dimensional view of what he was looking at. Um, clearly, if a surgeon opens the body cavity or makes, makes a craniotomy, they can see uh, the, the surface of an organ, um, but of course they can't see beneath it. So it, it seemed like a good idea to be able to reconstruct in three dimensions the critical, po critical targets that the surgeon might want to, to um, uh, approach. Um, so that's been a, a kind of a theme for a lot of the work that I've been doing over the years. Um, one curious um, thing is if you ask a surgeon what they would like to uh, aid them in reaching a target, they will tell you that they would like to see the, um, the three-dimensional image registered to the patient to be able to view the uh, an image of the patient somehow and see the three-dimensional image floating inside the patient so they can um, navigate to a target. When you go through the exercise of performing all of the mathematical um, processing and image registration and tracking to achieve that and you show this creation to the surgeon, they then throw up their hands in horror and say, I'm sorry, there's far too much information there. Um, I know that's what we asked you for, but maybe you have to simplify it somehow so that we can make sense of it when we're in the middle of a, of a, of a complicated surgery. So I think that was a, that was a message to me that um, while these augmented reality techniques are very valuable, we've got to also take into account the amount of information that we're showing to the surgeon such that they get the right message at the right time and they don't have extraneous data that's going to uh, overload their cognitive channels and cause them to make mistakes. Well, that's a great insight. So you're saying that um, if you ask the customer what their favorite use cases or preferred use cases are, you sometimes get a surprise. Nasir, have you found uh, your research is similar or supported this? And what use cases have you studied most closely? I mean, uh, we have been working in medical AR probably for the last uh, almost 20 years. But mostly, I would say, if I want to categorize, there are different ways of using augmented reality in medicine. It, it starts from our basic education of anatomy and biology uh, in, uh, you know, where we could relate instead of you know teaching the, the the kids that school teaching based on drawings and pictures and videos, they could interact with their own uh, body, on which we superimpose a lot of anatomical information. So the similar system we call it magic mirror, and people can see it in YouTube if they search for magic mirror and Kinect and etc. They can see in some museum we brought that and. People really enjoyed it to, to connect what they had learned to their own body and then have a better learning experience. Of course, the same system can come up all to the medical school, also in medical school in now in Netherlands and in Munich, they are starting to use it. The only difference is that the complexity of anatomical information and, uh, you know, education goes more and more complex and augmented reality allows us to go from very simple superimposition of a skeleton for kids in uh, you know in school to more complex in high school to very complex in medical school and then it can also help with training and simulation for surgical procedures or diagnostic procedures uh, finally what, of course, people like Terry and me are particularly interested is to augment the surgeons. And what was Terry was uh, mentioning is crucial in the sense that when we go to the real surgery, and of course they have so many information from CT, MR, uh, you know, PET, uh, SPECT, ultrasound, and they have too much information that they cannot access it 
in real time during operation. Uh, and uh, the, the major point uh, was mentioned by Terry was, in fact, what we need in that case, augmented reality becomes a kind of relevance-based augmentation. What is relevance at that point for a decision-making during action? And then one major issue in 90s, end of 90s, people started to augment microscopes to augment views of the surgeon. Already at that point, the problem was also not only relevance, but human perception. Human is not used to see virtual on top of real and percept the depth correctly. Now, if we want to bring a lot of information from depth onto the direct view of the surgeon, then again, we need to uh, play around with human perception such that the ordering of the depth is also well presented. So to tell you, compared to the augmented reality now we know on mobile phone or in movies or in game industry, in medical, whether it's education or whether it's surgical action, uh, it, it, it becomes much more critical to do a better work of understanding what the user needs at a given moment, what the level of expertise is, what the decision is going to be made by that fused data, and what is the action which will follow. And all this together has to come into intelligence of augmented reality. So I think the first augmented reality in surgery would be simple ones. I don't know whether I should tell it now or later. We will talk some examples based on how you want, Christine. But I think the first systems are going to be simple systems, but very useful. And as our technology and our knowledge goes higher, then we go to more complex system uh, as we move on. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, it seems like I saw, when I was doing research of the literature, many, many examples, uh, perhaps from yourself and, and, and Terry and, and others, that seemed highly um, sophisticated like brain or heart those were ex those were organs that seemed um, perhaps proportionally well represented or disproportionately well represented but uh, before I let you uh, talk about specific organs I'd like to give uh, Sleiman a little chance to introduce himself and share with us some of the use cases that you see in your work um, explain to us how what a Theer Labs does and how you select the use cases. Hi, Christine. Um, so uh, we're I'm not an MD, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, so at Theer we have these devices. Uh, they are a set of smart glasses that are fully mobile, uh, and they can show you uh, virtual objects in 3D and you can reach out and touch them in the middle of the air. Uh, so we're, we have, that's the technology that we have, and we're focusing first on the enterprise, and one of the very first markets that we're interested in supporting, and we're supporting, actually, we already have partnerships there, is the medical market. Uh, of course, being kind of a bit of outsiders to the market, we have to listen to the people who are feeling the pain, the people who are going through the experiences, uh, and solve their problems. Um, and, and like you heard before, actually, the way we divide it is that education is, a, is on a totally different level in terms of complexity compared to surgery. Uh, we already have uh, education applications. I think you were in one of the conferences where I demoed something. Um, since in education you can have, you can prepare things beforehand, you can have the markers. So from a technology side, you can control all of the aspects. You know what the student or trainee is looking at, um, and, and it's all human-made um, and prepared. But in a surgery, the problem is that the patient is breathing, they're moving, uh, you know, and all of that needs to change very accurately in, in real time. Um, and so, of course, we, we have an effort uh, in the training and education, uh, and that's going uh, really well. Of course, the value and the, the pressure that doctors feel 
is much more in the surgery. Uh, and there what we did is that we talked to a number of uh, doctors and uh, medical device companies, uh, mainly around the Bay Area, you know, Stanford and, uh, uh, well, the, the companies are everywhere. Uh, and we tried to identify where are the times where the doctors would feel the quality of care would increase dramatically if they were very easily able to access additional information. Uh, and of course, uh, actually, the, the top example that we got was for the anesthesiologist. And we actually got uh, directions into eye surgery because it seems that is more controlled, the eye is in fixed position, and the size uh, makes it very interesting. Uh, and so we are starting in, in tackling those uh, directions. Uh, of course, like you heard, ultimately, uh, hopefully the whole system will be so smart to give just the right information at the right time for, for the, to the doctor to, to optimize the outcome, to, to make sure the patient is, gets the best care possible. That's the, that's the goal. Yeah, that's a, that brings up a really good point about the use cases is since the use cases are so varied, you've all brought up uh, great examples. Um, in my webinar, I was emphasizing that um, patient outcome would be an important metric uh, to evaluate the return on investment and whether augmented reality really belongs uh, in, in a procedure. Um, I, I, I would like to invite Terry to tell us a little bit or give me some feedback about patient outcomes as, as a metric for, for these, these technologies. Is that appropriate? Is it uh, something that's useful to you or, or not so much? Well, I, I'm not sure that um, relying on patient outcomes to demonstrate the efficacy of uh, an augment a procedure that happened to use augmented reality is necessarily the right way to go. Um, may many procedures that we perform, or we would hope to perform with uh, augmented reality uh, assistance, um, the outcomes wouldn't be properly known for many, some years afterwards. However, as part of the, the surgical workflow, um, we can identify uh, areas where the AR addition might well have increased um, uh, surgeon's knowledge, increased the um, e efficiency of getting to a target, increased, increased the safety of reaching that, that target organ. And so I think we can make definitive statements about the value of augmented reality long before um, the four or five years has elapsed to see how well the patient is doing. For example, if if an equivalent, um, let's say, heart valve repair is done both with and without augmented reality, but the addition of augmented reality makes the procedure go five times faster and maybe um, many, many times more safely in the sense that you go straight to the target without um, the potential of um, poking an instrument into places inside the cardiac chamber where it shouldn't be going, then I think we can say um, long, long before the patient is, is recovered that this is going to be beneficial to the, to the procedure. I'd right, like to get yeah. his comment on that. Points. Good points, yeah. Um, do, do Nasir or, or Sliman, do you have any comments or feedback? Are there other metrics that you use or that you think others should adopt for um, quantifying I mean, this? You know, from my point of view, uh, you know, it's, I see augmented reality as a, a part of the user interface. I don't think the doctors should know augmented reality as augmented reality. And the best, I mean, for me always, the, the, the way of measuring our success is to let them play with our system uh, more and more. And then when they don't have it, if they ask for it, 
then that means that we have succeeded already. Basically, we, it's just we are this is a user interface to provide them additional information. Now, it's very complicated to measure the success in short term, as also Terry was telling, because, for example, we are hoping that this would accelerate the procedure, but this would definitely not happen uh, in the first years, because imagine you provide more information to a user. The, the user is more confident, but has to look at that additional information. You know, if you are drilling somewhere and you don't see anything, you have to use your information that you have, you have in your brain, you go faster than if I augment your view with additional anatomical information. Then you have it, you have to look at it and do. So first of all, I think the, you know, for example, improvement in the time of surgery would come after assimilation and learning period that would happen, how to deal with this additional information. And something that is much harder to measure quantitatively is the additional confidence that the surgeon gets in his action, the additional information he captures while doing an action. Again, of course, the holy grail or the ultimate uh, value or evaluation would be the outcome of the patients in the next five years. But I, I think in meantime, we can evaluate, can find different metrics of evaluation, which would not be the existing metric. Some of the metrics, for example, one of the systems we have is a camera augmented mobile CR, where the X-ray and optics see the same thing by construction. So that for example, one of the things that quickly comes and could be evaluated is that, of course, they can reduce the number of x-ray exposures. Because now they can see their hand and uh, the x-ray that they, it superimposed on the patient. So they can reduce the x-ray. This could be evaluated very quickly, and we did that. So you can reduce by a factor of seven uh, the number of, uh, uh, you know, X-rays that you need to take for some procedures and some other procedures, even a larger number of reduction. But at the same time, whether the outcome is improved, that comes through training, that comes through learning, and that comes through a multiple-year study to see whether the performance is also, you know, the outcome is also better. So it's a I would say is a you know is a something that we take time and new technology needs also new measure of uh, of quality. Same thing with uh, teaching at university. When we talk with people who are using augmented like reality for teaching, they need time to see whether the students perform better after you know a year or not. And this would always the outcome would be the key. Really. Yes. Yeah. Uh, probably a different view of the, you know, how companies are evaluating such technology. Exactly. Yes, I was just going to ask. I mean, as a startup and a young company, you, you don't, you don't want to have introducing things that take, uh, yeah, so long yes. to to assess. So, um, so, but just to just to frame things uh, in in how we see them, ultimately. In everything you do in medicine, your goal is to improve people's lives and, and healthcare, right? You want those uh, procedures and the whole experiences to be much, much better. But towards that goal, towards that ultimate metric, there are a number of metrics that feed into that metric in the long term and you can use in the short term as, as stepping stones. and. And even, even when you go to education, right, when you're educating uh, doctors better, basically the way I see it is that this is an investment in future, better future healthcare. Right? You're, you're getting them to, to learn faster, to learn more, to remember better, uh, to, to visualize things better. Uh, and that, that's a long-term investment, but ultimately it feeds into that. So the... The other metrics we try uh, we try to to use all relate to that. We try to make sure that the metrics that we are thinking about feed into uh, the 
the healthcare, right, providing best, the best care possible. And one very important metric that we've seen uh, in one of the use cases that I still didn't uh, talk about yet is actually making the experience and better and the stress lower on the care providers, on the doctors and the nurses and the support staff. So when the nurse is less stressed and he or she is, you know, don't have to keep running around for these long shifts and getting all of these alarms that they don't know if they're if they mean anything or not. Um, if if their experience is better, if their life is better, uh, then they can do a better job and they can offer better care for the customer. Um, so I believe the the field is early enough that we haven't isolated the, the full set of metrics. Uh, but, you know, of course, reducing time, reducing cost on patients, which basically means that even patients with lower uh, financial abilities can still get better care. Again, it, it always translates to care, uh, reducing time, reducing ter uh, reducing cost, um, and, of course, reducing the stress and, uh, and effort by uh, by the by the whole team, not just the surgeon uh, right. or or the the person under the line. These are these are the directions that we're that we and the companies that we're working with uh, are aiming at. Different uh, big companies. These are medical devices companies. They are aimed at different sectors from the just trying to make the hospital floor safer, less contamination is a big thing for us because now you're interacting with everything in the middle of the air. There are no keyboards that are touched by multiple people. There are no tablets that are touched by multiple people. And so trying to, to contain all of these factors that all feed back into uh, better uh, healthcare. Hmm. And uh, before we um, leave you, I'd, I want to talk a little bit about, we're going to transition now to talking about barriers to all this. There's many opportunities, a lot of great use cases, but I think we, sh we have already begun to identify, you know, uh, both our other guests have identified barriers. Do you see, um, what are the barriers to those very large companies that you mentioned maybe partnering with you now, what are the barriers to their entering this field in a, in a, a bigger way? You know, why, why do we not see Siemens and um, I mean, maybe they're there, but what, what's holding them back, you think? Yeah, there, there are actually a, uh, a number of things, right? Um, in, in their position, one thing that they're very afraid of, and they should be, is making mistakes, right? They, they don't want to change the workflow, change a certain surgery, introduce something inside it, and making a mistake would be, um, you know, would be really problematic for them in many ways. Um, and that makes them very, very, very careful, as they should be, um, about about what new things to introduce. And so there are all of these cycles and, uh, of course, approvals. The other big problem, so, you know, so one is the traditional well-known FDA, right, uh, challenges. The other bigger, big problem here is, is finding the right model between the hospitals, the medical device providers, and the doctors, and the insurance companies where where it fits right for everyone because you know if you're if you're if you're making insurance companies get less money then they will kind of create some problems for you or something like that maybe I'm being too um, too simplistic about it uh, but but basically you they're they're trying to transform it in a way uh, and there there's the the incumbent space there's the way things are already done um, and and you need to transform that uh, pretty carefully, and this is this is another thing that's making even even large companies, um, because they have all of these uh, you know relationships uh, that they need to make sure uh, are still going correctly. Otherwise, it will not work. 
right? And and again, if, if you think of the ultimate goal as being providing better uh, healthcare, then we need to make it work so that we can uh, push it to the future. And navigating yeah. that landscape is a bit difficult. It's, yeah, it's that's, I, I, I anticipate, I mean, I expect it is. I, I don't have any experience there. So I'd like to ask, um, uh, Nasir, you're in a, in a teaching hospital, I think, that you, you do some of your work in in those kinds of environments where the insurance companies are, the hospital provider, the physicians, how do you see the landscape of barriers? Is it technology is the biggest or is it these concerns about speed and compliance and regulations? How does that differ perhaps between Munich and the US also? I mean, it's not a difference between Munich and U.S., but I would tell you that, I mean, I, I don't see many barriers. I think there are one of the barriers until 10 years ago but were the, the doctors, uh, were the fact that, they, you know, historically when X-ray uh, was invented by Röntgen, uh, there is uh, there is an actually uh, an announcement issued by the medical community of that time that we should not act on a patient with a, based on x-ray without any symptom. Because in old time, at that time, the patient would go based on a symptom to doctors and then they, the patient would say, I have a pain here and then they would do an action. And then they were starting to see anomalies in x-ray and they would try to act on it. Some doctors were very reluctant. They were telling, oh, we need to first see a symptom. After 100 years, now we try to predict, uh, you know, 40 years before something happens, and we even do dramatic actions on a, on a child because we know that in 40 years something may happen. So there was a barrier which were the usage of the doctors. I mean, that barrier is little by little get, you know, going away because they are start to rely on multimodal imaging, on fusion, on identity reality, they start to believe in it. So, you know, we have one out of our university collaboration with the nuclear medicine. We, there is a company called, little company called Surgicide. They have been using augmented reality in their user interface for uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy, doing, you know, augmentation of uh, what we, they call intraoperative spec onto the patient, and this has been uh, now used over thousands of patients. I mean, they, it was never called augmented reality, but doctors had the, had the option to use the augmented reality on a monitor or a virtual reality for measuring distances, or none of them. And implicitly, we measured how often they use it, and in certain phases of the surgery, systematically all of them use the augmented reality user interface. And in some phases they use the virtual reality, in some phases they didn't use any of the two. So it was very easily accepted now. Uh, again, companies, also big companies like Siemens was looking into augmented reality for a while. You know, Frank Sauber between 98 and 2002 ran a group inside Siemens Corporate Research in Princeton which created a very beautiful head-mounted display for augmented reality in medicine. And also our first 40 patient X-ray uh, augmented reality with, uh, with a C-arm was, the insurance was paid by Siemens, it was, was sponsored even if we did it at the hospital. So I think the big companies are looking into it. What Suleiman was telling is totally true. They want to do go through, you know, FDA approval. That was what happened with the Surgic Eye Solution. Uh, you, you know, CE certification in Europe. They want for the first phase it's costly because it's a novel technology, so you have to pay the insurance, a different insurance because this, this, for example, is not yet validated, but. My approach is that the companies are interested, the doctors are now ready to take it, so we are in a very good good point, and I think 
The barriers, of the usual barriers, one of the most difficult barriers from my point of view is that in a surgical situation, we have to fully understand the surgery, we have to monitor it, and automatically find out which information is needed at which time. Having a surgeon wearing a head-mounted display for two hours of a surgery is unreasonable, is incorrect. Having him, you know, having an HMD that he needs for visualizing something for three minutes, three minutes needs us to automatically know that. I leave to you. Okay. I have to um, uh, agree with, with Nessia. Uh, things take time to get accepted. In my lifetime, I've seen the uh, medical imaging going from just plain x-rays and, and fluoro through to CT and MRI. When CT first came along, many of my uh, physician colleagues uh, smiled at me and said, um, go away, we don't really need CT, we do just, just fine with x-rays. Um, Five years later, they were uh, they had adopted, embraced CT scanning. Then MRI came along. Who would who never whoever would want a magnet in in a, in a radiology room? I mean, magnets don't give images. Leave us to our CT scans. And so things go on. Um, with with augmented reality, um, as Nessie pointed out, we've actually been using these techniques for a long, long time. Um, Thirty years ago, I was building. Um, neurosurgical stereotactic planning systems for surgeons to navigate around the brain to plan where they wanted to put an electrode, plan where they wanted to um, ablate some tissue. Um, we didn't call it augmented reality and it was, and it was a, a virtual model of the brain that we could manipulate, we could measure, we could plan where we wanted to put an electrode. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily uh, visually registered to the patient. It was mathematically registered to the patient. Um, we knew that if we put um, uh, an electrode at point X, Y, Z on in, in the three-dimensional image, um, through registration to the patient, that probe would go to point X, Y, Z in the patient. Right, but are, let's talk about barriers that we that you've encountered. You know, are they? You're saying they're not technological. That's one of the things I'm hearing. You're saying we've had this technology around for quite a long time. Are they financial? Is this too costly? Um, is it, uh, you know, about procedures and changing? You said there's a lot of reluctance. I think change. it's mostly about changing the way people do things. For example, I, I strongly believe that um, in the case of um, intracardiac procedures, for example, we could do these procedures as safely, but remove reliance on x-rays, on heart-lung machines, on um, the dangers of radiographic contrast. Um, if we used ultrasound techniques that were quite simply augmented with, with, with computer graphics, um, but getting a cardiac surgeon who's been used to using x-rays or a cardiologist who's been using x-rays for interventional radio uh, interventional cardiology for decades to get them to change the way that they do the procedure to just using ultrasound um, with maybe a, a, a fairly a, a fancier display it's it's a it's a tough tough battle so we really have to work on our uh, cardiology and cardiac surgery colleagues who become invested in uh, these projects who recognize the value, well first of all recognize the limitations of existing techniques and recognize, and, and I'm very lucky to have, to have colleagues I work with right now who recognize that one of the reasons they're having uh, failures with some of these um, cardiac procedures is that the imaging is terrible. And so they're strongly supporting us to develop these prototypes and to, to demonstrate them on animal models to show that uh, we can actually do better. So I think that's the biggest barrier that I see, getting the uh, clinicians buy-in to using these new paradigms. Okay, good. Uh, I yeah, actually yeah. agree. I just want to point out that it's mm -hmm. not like there are no technology barriers. Uh, there, there are the way I see it is that there are a couple of steps. With the current technology, we can go much farther 
uh, than we can, but there are uh, barriers of adoption and uh, basically the, the existing space. But, uh, like they were saying, medicine is difficult. And, you know, I, I've worked uh, in medicine, I've worked in uh, electrical engineering, and, and it's very hard for many, many reasons. There are so many levels. There are, there's all the chemistry behind it. There's, there are so many things uh, because it's not just about blood flowing. It's about how much oxygen there is in that blood, right, and, and how everything is going right. Um, and, um, and weak technology can go very, very far yet. There, if the technology can still improve a lot, and we're, uh, you know, there's a lot that can be done. Well, that's a very positive uh, uh, statement, and I, I, I think um, your colleagues must share this, or I wouldn't still be in this domain. Um, you know, uh, what about uh, Nasir? You have some great examples about augmented reality for rehabilitation. Uh, people who have strokes and other um, uh, injuries, perhaps. Can you give us a little more about that? Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, in rehabilitation, there have been several uh, groups around the board who have worked. We also worked, but also uh, Christopher, St Christopher Stapleton, uh, other groups have worked on this subject. So the idea is you would, uh, you know, the People after a stroke, for example, they need to learn again many things, and they uh, either they are doing actions or they are processing to do to learn everyday uh, uh, you know everyday tasks that they have to do. And the nice thing about augmented reality and uh, you know simple uh, tracking with Kinect and visualization is that they can evaluate what they do themselves. They can. Pro they can make progress. At the same time, they can be observed with, uh, by a doctor remotely or in presence of the doctor. So basically, for example, the system tells you in order to train your right hand, you have to do this action. But very often, the people don't do the action completely, uh, and then the effect is not there. Now, the augmented reality can show them if the muscle is getting activated because the action is completely done or if the muscle is not getting activated, so we are doing augmentation, and then they guide them, and sometimes even they make them play a game. They touch a virtual ball, and then the system gives them a score, and the score is shown based on you know, whether the muscle is activated, uh, and things like that. So they, I think augmented reality can come into the life of elderly and also you know, sportives, uh, as a part of in their home, in their display, and uh, you know, but the nice thing is also it can be transmitted to the doctors. So I yeah, think that's it's another place. Excellent, excellent point. Um, I was just going to ask the um, Terry, where are some other? Uh, you just heard some examples where people in the audience, the general public might be able to see examples of, of augmented reality. Do you, do you know places or some situations today? Uh, are, is it appropriate to use augmented reality for uh, communicating with the patient? Is it a concern to you that um, maybe patients uh, don't need that much information? Or where do we draw the line on that? Do you have any opinions, uh, Terry? I think it can be valuable in, in helping a patient understand um, the, the nature of his, his illness just by, it's more a, a sort of virtual reality rather than an augmented reality um, environment, but to be able to have um, sort of 3D models that you can display on a computer screen to a patient, I think that can, that can help them. Um, one of the other areas which I found quite compelling that you probably heard when you were at the Munich conference was from... Uh, uh, Tom Furness from the Hit Lab, when he was describing um, his use of uh, virtual reality for pain control in in chronically um, ill patients, um, I thought that was a, a, a fascinating uh, example of the use of this this technology to um, to block chronic pain in, in patients. Um, something I'd never heard of before, but uh, it seemed to be very very effective. 
Fantastic. Uh, Sliman, do you have some examples where people could today already uh, see your technologies in action or perhaps those of your partner or companies visualization of this this data uh, today already? Uh, yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, with the, the trials that we're doing are still uh, controlled within uh, within hospitals and with uh, some doctors, uh, but they but the easier ones to get to are uh, are the education uh, ones, um, and and just getting uh, all of that information actually an an interesting uh, uh, application. Is is for just like you were saying, uh, data display and data uh, management, um, and uh, and with that application, the doctor um, and and the guardians of a patient can can track the data and the progress, uh, and they can take actions based on uh, you know uh, based on all of that information. Uh, and these systems, I mean, I believe over 2015, those systems will start being seen uh, by people. They will be used, uh, and 2016 will be the year of uh, like the early adopters, the big early adopters in numbers. So um, we're getting there. It's uh, the, the timing is really good. Yes, uh, to hear Nasir and Terry, it's uh, it's only taken 30 years. You know. We're getting closer and closer. It's really about timing, isn't it? Timing is so critically important to the success. Uh, uh, great examples, gentlemen, of uh, how people have been aware of the use of technology for a long time, and and that's continuing to evolve. Um, I would like to uh, see if there are, are any questions uh, from. From the audience, uh, David, do you do you have any questions for our panel today? Okay. Um, well, let's see. Um, one of the questions is: uh, Do what are what do the panelists think about um, the many different standards organizations that? that are out there, which ones are the most important in your minds? And, or, or do we, do we need to be um, concerned about new standards that might help us to have uh, integration, faster and better integration with existing systems? Uh, Terry, you seem to be, uh, uh, would you like to answer that? Um, it's really not a question I've thought too much about, and I think we have to, um, we have to understand what we what we mean when we're talking about augmented reality. We we tend to use it as a um, as as a new technology that we want to use. But I see it more as in in the terms that Nasir um, described it earlier on as being uh, a part of a user interface towards to to, to a particular problem. So I'm not sure. Um, I'm not even clear in my mind how different standard organizations would sort of come into this equation. Um, well, I can, an example is like around device communications, like um, the Ethere Labs uh, device needs to communicate perhaps wirelessly with embedded devices in the patient or machine instruments in the environment. Those are, that's one example. Um, uh, I think 3D models, uh, you, you're all um, so deeply into this that for you the, the 3D models are just natural. But in, in, in fact, um, converting a scan and, a, and a, you know, a, a point cloud into a model that you can use in these scenarios is probably very, very uh, challenging. Yeah, actually, from that, yeah. From that perspective, I think um, the the DICOM consortium has gone a long way towards helping us um, get access to these data. And I was I, I wasn't really thinking in those terms originally, but um, 30 years ago, we we didn't have any DICOM standards, and it was a total nightmare to get this information from different scanners and to put it into some sort of common format. So I think that's I think the the community has been helped tremendously by. Uh, the, the DICOM consortium 
getting together and providing a standards with first CT, then MRI, now even ultrasound and, and other um, uh, techniques. Perhaps um, three and four dimensional models um, will follow that. So I think, yeah, that's a, that's a role where standards, that particular um, standards group will continue to help us. Does anybody have any work or any <coughs> opinions about uh, the HIMS, the Healthcare Information Management, and uh, the role of that organization? So maybe I can just tell a few things. I mean, I had thought before coming to fully into medical, I was also in industrial like magnetic reality. And uh, what I found that uh, standards there is extremely important in the sense that any data I wanted to get from different companies, Siemens, BMW, others, was CAD models. And CAD models were not ready for augmented reality. So uh, what I needed, it was a CAD model that we were calling it computer vision CAD models, a CAD model which could include visual information like main features, textures, etc., that would be ready with plugins for augmented reality, which means that I could take, you know, I do not need, I did not need for any piece of industry creating a way of detecting it, augmenting it, or put markers on it. Have it inside the CAD model tells me what is the information. So for me, uh, what, uh, you know, if we could start having this information, not only in the diagram, but expose information such as you know, the parameters of acquisition, the viewing parameters, the, you know, how I can manipulate those, or if I have multiple multimodal data, how do I can get access to each detail, geometrical or feature information, even having segmentation information included into the data. If we could go towards those things which facilitate fusion and augmented reality, of course, it would be very, very interesting, but it has to take its pace and get there uh, one by one now. I think the, the professional person in the team can also tell what he thinks about the standards that he sees. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Nasir. Um, so actually, if we think about, about standards and why they are there, you don't need standards if you're working on your own then you just do things your way and, and that's it. Um, standards are there to allow multiple people to create multiple different things that work together really right. right? I think this is the, the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing, uh, I believe, is that standards should be transparent in general to the end user. So the doctor doesn't have to know whether the model they're dealing with is this type or that type or whatever and how it's translated from one to the other. That should be transparent and what allows the easy portability, you get the doctor and you give her another system and she can just use it. If you have the right standards, even their experience across different things will be the same because they shouldn't worry about these things. They should worry about taking that data, understanding it uh, and dealing with it. And, and so I believe there are a number of important things in terms of which standards that uh, we care for in um, terms of AR. Um, and, and they can be separated at least into three categories. One is the communication. Multiple devices, multiple systems talking to each other and stuff like that. The other is the data where the CAD model or, or some information, or even the scans, right? You have real, real-time data about uh, certain measurements, um, you know, again, of the oxygen, of the heart rate, of the brain, uh, uh, the brain activity, uh, and, and showing those in a certain way. Uh, but the third, which is there in augmented reality, and I don't think it's anywhere else, yeah, it's the real-time matching of virtual objects to physical objects. So the way you map, for example, a 3D model onto the patient's lungs, uh, right? That needs to be done in a certain way. Which markers? So, so in augmented reality, 
um, the way you match the, the digital model to the physical uh, object is that you have these features that are used to identify different parts of the object. And, and we need to have standards about that so that if I'm using a different device, it would match the model similarly correctly to the same accuracy uh, in the same way. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of collaboration. And I think from the technology side, actually, of course, um, you know, uh, IEEE, just because right, anything that you do with uh, electronics and computer science um, can, can be a, bit, a very important hub uh, to where and, and the center where uh, we can create the, the standards, we can work together. Um, and I think there's some very interesting work which would make the life of many people so much easier just yeah. if we have the right standards from the beginning. Yeah, that's a, uh, you opened up a, a, quite a variety of different topics there. Uh, very, very good. And um, uh, we don't have uh, any time left for um, any more questions. Uh, I guess uh, I would li like to encourage our audience, and in particular, I'm, I, I'd like to encourage those big companies that you work with, Nasir, and that all of you have partnerships with, to begin thinking about how they can more actively uh, participate in this. Be very, very good to um, to see that um, uh, those uh, you know heavyweights. <laughs> coming in in the future. So I, I, I trust that people will be able to follow up with you individually if they have specific questions and the IEEE can forward any uh, remaining questions to us directly. That's actually all the time we have today. It's been a great discussion. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for sharing your views about augmented reality in, in these medicine and health care situations. As a reminder, this Google Hangout is part of the series of virtual events organized by the IEEE on the subject of augmented reality. And for more information on upcoming events, please do visit the IEEE AR in Your Future uh, webpage. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.